Hey, welcome back. Another episode on the Weiler Toolroom lathe. The machine has lived in my shop for almost a month now. I already used it for customer parts. It's working extremely well. I installed a DRO. I put cutting oil into the coolant system. And overall, it's just a matter of getting used to the machine and using it to its full extent. I wanted to go over a few points in this video, like installing the linear scales. I'm talking about solid tool post or no solid tool post and the reasoning behind it. Uh, a quick, quick chat about the cutting oil and also moving the machine into position. So let's, uh... oh yeah, uh, when I moved the machine into place, I also rearranged the shop a little bit. So I might start with a quick pan through the shop. So there's the Weiler lathe. It's all the way in the corner right next to the window and that's where the Emco used to live. By the way the Emco is sold. A friend bought it from me for a fair price for both of us and it's living a happy life. To the left there is still the Deckel FP1 toolroom mill currently with a table or indexer. Indexer is sitting down there. This is the place where I used to have a large workbench to sit down. I decided that it's time to get rid of a workbench and I changed things a little bit around. So I have a, a cart with a drawer cabinet on top. And this is like a staging area for the lathe, just to stage out tools have a place to, to have my uh, the measuring tools that I'm using on a project and just flat surface and some drawers. And I do a, I try to keep an honest effort to keep it clutter free. Yeah, I know there is the meme of horizontal surfaces get cluttered, but in my opinion, that's just an excuse for uh, not, not <laughs> for, for uh, not trying to. <laughs> so uh, surface plate with the taser height moved into this corner. Uh, I'm quite happy with that position. Uh, has a nice overhead light here on the surface plate. And the biggest change probably is the old stand from the Emco lathe. I took the stand the, my friend who bought the lathe didn't want the stand because he's going to solve it differently. And I cut it down a little bit. I extended the feet down there. So it's a nice standing height. It's like a meter 10 tall. And I ordered, I had a, a local company cut me a 15 millimeter thick plate as a tabletop for it. So now I have an extremely sturdy workbench for standing height and I'm really enjoying that. Uh, it's very convenient to have such a solid table. Currently I have the hydraulic press set up here because I'm doing a production job in it. That's also why I have the die set in there with the, with the columns. Uh, that's a secret squirrel project unfortunately. I cannot show anything of it. Also I'm keeping the TIG welder next to it and the oxy fuel cart. Uh, the camera tripod Shop in the other side has not changed very much. There is still the CNC with the cardboard enclosure, which is holding up way too good. This drawer cabinet has gotten a, a tabletop out of wood just to make it a little bit more workbenchy. This vise is not bolted down. It can go on to the steel bench in the other room with four screws, but I need the entire tabletop currently, so I just took it off. There's still the, the large drill press, surface grinder, and the tool cutter grinder back there. On this side, I got rid of some of the support equipment. I got rid of the diamond lapping machine because I'm doing that mostly on the tool cutter grinder now and also got rid of the tiny belt sander. I want a big belt sander and uh, it's uh, the small one just is taking up too much space here. 
that I need otherwise. Uh, bandsaw and the hardness system back there. Ultrasonic cleaner still living here. So yeah, that's how the shop is arranged right now. So I have the dial indicator riding the rail on the back side that will mount the linear scale. And let's zero it out. It's zero now. Now I'm running it along. Keep in mind it's a extruded anodized aluminum uh, profile and it's not that straight. It's running away on the end a little bit. I could straighten it out, but to be honest, it's fine. That's well within 40 microns over a, a measured length of 317 millimeters or something like that. So that's perfectly adequate. So, and here is another view of the rail. I'm using existing holes in this case, just drill new holes into the rail. And this is how I indicate it. In. Basically, you bolt it down on one end, loose, leave one side loose, and then you bump it until it's true end to end. Uh, mounting linear scales is one of the worst tasks in a machine shop or when building machines in general. It's an annoying process in general and um, on this machine, it's, it's kind of easy because all surfaces that I need are machined. But on many machines, when you deal with cast surfaces round, if it's an older machine, you have very often rounded castings. And those are a pain to deal with. Either you don't have any problems machining an existing casting and just make it flat where you want to mount, or it's a lot of shimming and making custom brackets. I will be making custom brackets here too because the the brackets that you get delivered with a digital readout are often kind of useless for a general use. So that's the linear scale. Let's move it to its extreme end. And we leave it a little bit of gap. Now we need to figure out a bracket to go from the carriage down here. I handcrafted an aluminum bracket that mounts to the carriage up here and to the reed head of the linear scale down here. Uh, this is just five millimeter or four millimeter aluminum sheet. It's only, it only needs to be stiff in this direction and this direction. The sideways stiffness is neglectable in this application. If we, we exhort some pressure on here, it will bend, but that doesn't actually influence the measurement. <clears throat> and also there is no reason any, any force should hit the bracket in this direction. The reed head to the scale, the orientation of the reed head to the scale is not very critical. They have quite a loose tolerance in or range of, of uh, distance and also side to side alignment that they work without influencing the precision. They are just couple, the, the slider that runs in the linear scale runs on ball bearings in the slide and the reed head is just coupled with a piece of spring wire to this carriage. So you're not influencing the precision of the carriage in here with reasonable alignment errors of the reed head. That's also the reason why there, there is only a 3D printed shim between the reed head and this back plate here to fill up the height difference. So that's done. That's the carriage. The last, last step is to mount the cover over the linear scale. This just gives a little bit of additional protection, some more space. Uh, when you mount linear scales, mount them in a way the the seals uh, where the reed head runs on are facing ideally downwards or away from the machine area but preferable downwards it's not always possible especially on vertical mount the linear scales then you have to mount them away from the machining area so no chips go in i have seen 
linear scales mounted with the lips towards the machining area and they lasted for years but it's just not good practice it's really <laughs> it's not not just not good practice it's awful practice so let's screw this cover down so the carriage carriage linear scale usually is the simplest of all of them just have to make sure you have full travel over its entire length so you don't crash the linear scale if you if you crash a linear scale usually you notice it by small shards of glass falling out on the underside or the uh, the die cast carriage inside the linear scale cracks um, at least that's what I heard. So with the easiest linear scale being the carriage to the second most annoying one that is the cross slide but also that's the most important. I decided to put the scale in this case on the on the side of the tailstock. I'm aware of the Abbey error from a tilting uh, cross slide but since this machine is in extremely good condition, new, I expect it to be not a problem and if it is a problem I can still whoop, swap it around on the other side but I hope I don't have to do that. So on this side of course you have the problem of the gib adjust the screws we have to clear those so I took a piece of uh, precision ground flat stock and I milled out the back pocketed it out so this goes over the screws and uses two holes that are already here from the previous linear scales that were mounted here uh, to hold it in place. So this bolts on to here like this. Uh, final assembly will be done with uh, filler gauges to get it nice and evenly spaced to everything. For rough assembly I'm just eyeballing it now like this. So then we have the linear scale and the aluminum mounting plate. I want to use the aluminum mounting plate because that allows me to use the factory cover on top of it just to give the linear scale a little bit more of protection. Uh, it would be okay to mount it without the cover but uh, well, it doesn't hurt, it's just making it better. So this will bolt onto here. And also if I have to adjust the gib, oh, don't drop the linear scale. And also if I have to adjust the gibs now, I only have to remove those two screws which hold the steel rail in place and the screw down here that holds the reed head in place. And I can take the entire assembly off and not have to muck around with the cover and the linear scale itself which is quite nice I think. So now I just have to figure out the position of this um, of the carrier plate. The reed head goes between the two rails of the bed like this. And then going almost to the extreme end of the travel of the linear scale moving in a little bit then I'm marking the position of the rail onto here this is really not high precision uh, locating it's just um, one millimeter here or there is not a big deal so let's move the carriage to the other end and see if the travel of the linear scale is enough Uh, I ordered a slightly longer linear scale than I need, of course. Let's see. Put it onto here on my markings from before and see if I can get the reed head back between the rails. And that is the case. So this position that I marked is good.
means I can remove the rail. and transfer the holes from the aluminum rail into the steel rail and uh, drill and tap those. Then I already have the linear scale mounted to the cross slide. Then we just have to muck around with the, with the compound anymore. So this goes on here like this. Steel rail, aluminum carrier for the linear scale linear scale mounted. Reed head is still flopping around in a breeze, but you can already see when I put the cover on here that it's a reasonable clean setup as it is. Uh, I'm, I'm quite fond of it. Uh, it doesn't add too much. I don't lose much travel if I need to use the, uh, what's that thing called? Um, the air hose hanger. Uh, I need to add on hard stops so I don't bump the the chip guard of the tailstock into the <laughs> the reed head. And also I need to make a bracket, of course, for the um, what you call it um, reed head. But this looks quite nice. It doesn't interfere with any of the lubrication points. It doesn't interfere with any of the mounting points for. Uh, accessories that go on top of the cross slide. For example, back here there are holes to mount the taper attachment. Uh, also, there are large holes to mount the T-slot table if you decide to add the milling attachment, will I, which I definitely will not do because that's an annoying piece of equipment. That's the final linear scale mount on the cross slide. And Yes, I ignored the Abbey error. I didn't mount it on the other side because, as I said, there are all the holes and there and the mounting position was good. Uh, I will see if this creates problems from uh, the measurement device being very far away from the actual tooltip. So, uh, gaining experience that way, making mistakes or not. We will see. Oh, that's the wrong cover. So, just made an aluminum bracket that bolts onto the carriage and the, the linear scale rides the cross slide itself. Cover goes on. There we go. Uh, currently, the, the tailstock bumps into the two screws here that hold the reed head. So this doesn't damage the reed head. Uh, the impact force goes through the screw into the carriage. But in reality, I don't use the, the stock anyways, but I want to uh, 3D print maybe a little TPU soft stop that goes over this thing. So yeah, that, that's the... What's the linear scale for the cross slide? I wasn't too happy with the first iteration of my bracket here. Uh, had some mishaps here and I decided to make a new one because well, didn't like it. Uh, one, one little problem when you work on machines is how do you transfer the location of a, a threaded hole onto a part that you want to bolt to it? And the answer is transfer screws, of course. It's a very old school trick. You screw them in, you place your part on it, hit it with a hammer, and you transfer punch the location of the hole onto your part. I don't have transfer screws. Uh, I just usually use a pointed set screw that I almost all the way insert in the bore or in the thread. And here I have two magnets. Keen viewers might remember these. I made these many, many years ago and I used them many, many times. These give me my, my lower alignment. 
and I have a gauge block back here and that gives me my side to side alignment. Then I just get everything in place, use a non marring hammer, rawhide in this case and dunk, transfer the location of the set screw onto my part here. So that, that should do fine. That should do fine. These magnets work marvelous. That, that's a really nice little project that you can do yourself with. Well, all you need is a milling machine. If you want them to be fancy, you can surface grind them or ask a friend of a surface grinder. But in many cases, a nice fly cut or a nice end milled finish will do very nicely. So here's the new bracket, just the old one with the um, some minor blemishes and also this one fits better. So sometimes you have to redo parts. Yes, I know 3D printing would be a good idea in this case to prototype the part before you cut metal, but in all honesty, I'm, I'm quite fast on a manual mill and this didn't take very long. Let's see if we can finagle it into place. This is waiting to cut me open. Okay. Get my alignment magnet out there. There's a linear scale. This rail I already aligned with dial indicator to run true with the cross slide of the machine, of course. And here are the screws for the reed head. goes on top. Okay. Okay, doesn't look terrible to me. Now we need to find a way to mount this micro scale, miniature scale. Uh, this is a five micron reading scale uh, to the compound. The holes in the, in the base of the compound already match up with the holes in the reed head. So this could work out. We have to switch the cable from one side to the other. Um, you can take these reed heads apart and switch the orientation of the cable in these. It's not particular hard usually, at least on the bigger scales. I have not done this to a micro scale so far, but we'll see. At least there is an opening to, to have the cable go the other, way, other side. Otherwise we would have to mount it backwards means we don't have the kind of bores for the screw heads. But uh, in all honesty, it should, it should be should be doable like this and just make a bracket that goes that mounts onto these holes. Has the right thickness, clears these screws 
and it's good to go. And the cable will run. I have to double check if I can, can run the cable inside. Oh there. oh, there is not enough room there. Yeah, uh, I will figure the cable out later. But first, we have to mount the scale somehow here. I found a piece of aluminium flat bar that's conveniently exactly the right length. Yes, this was really my scrap bin. Uh, I will give it a, a relief cut here for the for the adjuster screws in the same way so I can just remove the entire scale, uh, uh, scale assembly to reach onto these screws. I machined an aluminium rail instead of the delivered aluminium carrier that came with the linear scale because I needed the extended length. And at first I wanted to use the original cover on top of it, but turns out um, I tried to switch the cable on this miniature scale uh, around, but on these you have no option to split the case and get the cable the other way around. And the PCB in there is in some conformal coding and I didn't want to dig through that to get the PCB out and get the cable flipped around. So I mounted the, the scale basically in the wrong way. Which is not a problem for the euro because you can't change the counting direction of the readout. Uh, but yeah, uh, since I had to use button head screws here, counter, counter bores are on the back side now, um, the original cover doesn't fit over the screws anymore. So but I have had a piece of aluminium angle extrusion that with a little bit of milling fits very nicely over the linear scale and gives gives nice protection for the scale itself. Just like this, bolts in two places and I will machine some filler pieces on both ends so we get some stiffness in this direction too and it doesn't have to get uh, all carried from the two screws. I took the piece of aluminum extrusion and screwed in two ends. This is our chest aluminum blocks and they are screwed in from two sides with countersunk screws. Also beat blasted it to make it look nice because it seemed like I used the, the aluminum extrusion before as a backing plate for welding. That's why it was so scorched up. But now it uh, looks very nice. And it protects, it, it has some distance to the linear scale behind it. So if something hits this, uh, this will take the grunt of the hit and not the linear scale, which is the expensive part. So that's all three axes of the machine now set up with linear scales, which brings us to the readout itself. And that's the readout I got, including some glare. Yes, I know a polarization filter will remedy that, but I don't have one here. Uh, it's the Icron AV30 something something. Uh, three axis readout, X for diameter, C which is the carriage, move the carriage, and C1 which is the compound. The compound counts in five micron increments and the carriage in one micron because that's a one micron scale and the diameter counts in two. Doesn't count at all because we lost connection. <laughs> uh, the compound counts in two microns because the scale is one micron and uh, we're doubling. We're, well, we're taking the diameter instead of the radius. Um, has some interesting functions. It has a compound angle function. 
where you can set your angle of the compound. For example, if you if you put the compound, uh, how does that work? Uh, to 45 degrees. Um, it corrects the position of all three axes if you move the compound. Doesn't do it if you just move the carriage or the diameter. But when I move the compound at an angle, it follows, it, it drags along the two other coordinates, which is quite a nice feature, but it requires you to set the angle extremely accurate, otherwise this is complete bogus. It has a, a tool, a tool library, but I don't use that. What I use are the set datum points for the uh, for each individual tool. So I set, for example, STM1, which is a turning tool, to my diameter. Set my STM2 to, and and so on and so on. But yeah, that's the the readout. I like these. They're affordable and have nice functionality. And they have real buttons. The Heidenhain ND7030 that I have on my Surface Grind, it doesn't have buttons, which is fine on the grinder because I don't do a lot of typing on it, but on a lathe, I'm constantly changing stuff around. I'm, I'm changing tools, means I need to change coordinate systems um, like 10 times a minute sometimes. And that's just nicer with some real tactile buttons. I ordered some relatively nice anti-vibration feet for the lathe, but I also wanted to put the machine off the ground because I'm fairly tall and with the machine sitting directly on the floor, it's kind of too low for me. Um, I need to bend over quite a bit. So I decided to put the machine on 100 millimeter risers plus the 25 millimeters on the anti-vibration feet lifting it by about 125 millimeters in total. Problem is that the threaded rods that came with the anti-vibration feet are of course too short for such a large distance. So here I'm cutting new pieces of threaded rod and adding the hex on the back using direct indexing of the NECLEF P1 indexing head just to buzz on the, the hex, which will later be used to level the machine. These are the anti-vibration feet and the aluminum spacers that I prepared. The threaded rod goes in the anti-vibration feet and these are used to adjust the final height. Then the spacer goes on and this bolts to the underside of the machine. I finally got myself a full-sized pallet jack because while I have the small lifting cart, it's not able to lift, for example, a pallet, a standard Euro pallet lengthwise. And this is also extremely useful to move machines because it has a load rating of like two tons. Bolting on the anti-vibration feet. They are just tightened in place for now. When moving machines with a pallet jack, you have to be careful. Uh, pallet jacks are not the most stable imp implement of moving in the world, especially with top heavy items like a lathe. I've done this in the past. I've done it often and I'm quite confident in doing it. But if you do it yourself, be extremely careful and always have a backup plan. Uh, there is a reason why I bolted the feet onto the machine already. This is just as a safety against tipping. Shouldn't need it because I'm moving very slowly and I'm always keeping an eye on where the machine is going. So finagling it into final position. There's just a lot of back and forth to to get it oriented correctly. And pellet jacks are kind of annoying because the moment there is like a cutoff of a zip tie or a gap between the floor tiles, uh, it comes to a dead stop. And it's really hard to get it moving 
and not overshoot like crazy. Um, at my former day job, we often we we did movement of machine components daily, and usually we had to broom ahead of the pedal check constantly to to make things go smoothly. So here it's almost in place, um, along with a, with a pallet jack, some large construction lumber, large cross-section construction lumber is always useful to move a machine into position. Here the, the maximum lift of the pallet jack did not allow me to lift the machine directly, so I had to use the, the lumber as a spacer. And there it's almost in place. On the coolant side, this machine is equipped with a like 20 liter tank pump and a full return system for the coolant. But coolant water, mixable coolant or uh, emulsion, that's oil mixed with water. Uh, that's the milky white watery stuff that you see often on vertical machining centers or CNC lathes or manual machines too. Uh, has a problem or a drawback. Uh, two drawbacks, three drawbacks, uh, a bunch of drawbacks. First, uh, the coolant is water-based and if there is a problem with the mixing ratio, it will lead to rust. And if you ever have purchased an old machine tool that has run water-based coolant, well, you will find rust. In 99% of cases, the machine will be rusted. If you take parts off and areas that cannot be cleaned, there will be rust, no matter what. Second problem, it's not very healthy. Or, well, it, it, uh, in certain cases it can, it can be harmful. Uh, fungi can grow in it. Uh, there are problems with when it, it gets sprayed in the shop by a high-speed spindle, you breathe it in. Well, you have that problem with oil too, but with the coolant, you also breathe in the fungi. So that's a problem. Uh, it can go rancid and um, also the lubrication quality of it at low speed applications like reaming, tapping, diamond burnishing, <laughs> uh, and also small diameter turning is not very good. It's significantly more bad than oil. Small diameter turning is of course for me very interesting because that's what I do a lot. And I tried coolant out of a hand bottle, out of a minimum quantity system, and it's just not cutting it, literally. The uh, difference between coolant and oil is so significant that I decided to run this machine with cutting oil. I purchased a canister, 20 liter canister of a uh, it's not a cutting oil per se, it's, um, it's a punching and um, deep draw oil that's based on a cutting oil with some more additives to make it more uh, suitable for punching, but it's also suitable as a cutting oil. I, I got this because it's um, compatible with all metals that I work with. It doesn't attack like copper or aluminium or discolor it, which would be really bad in some cases with the parts I make. Um, and it's available in 20 liter canisters and I don't have to buy an entire barrel of it, which is very expensive. Cutting oil is expensive. You pay anything between 5 and 10 euros a liter at best. So I got, got the oil. I, got, uh, I called the people from Ölheld. That's literally translated to oil hero. 
uh, the company in Germany, I got the recommendation from a friend who, who um, and uh, Ölheld also runs a lot of oil in Kern CNC mills. That's why I know them. Also, they make EDM fluids for RAM EDM. They are rather well known in the industry, at least here in Germany. And they recommended this oil to me. I purchased it and that's what I filled into the tank here. And that's also what I'm using right now. And when we turn on the pump, there it is. That's that's uh, that's cutting oil, not coolant. The nice thing about it is, is oil. It won't. It will never go bad. It won't get rancid. It won't get grow uh, fungi. It, it um, won't cause rust. So the machine basically is always rust protected. And everything that I do on here is rust protected. The drawback is it's oil. It's well, it's never drying. Everything that's oily, you need to clean if you want to be, to be oil free. Chips will collect a lot of oil and that will go to scrap if you don't do anything about it. Short of buying a chip centrifuge, which uh, those exist and those are very expensive and very big, which I won't buy one. Um, I can push the chips to the side and have them just drip off naturally over the night and clean the chip pan in the morning. Also, you get oil on the floor, it gets slippery, you fall on your face. Uh, that's annoying. You get oil all over you, that's annoying. But that's also happening with coolant, that's also annoying. The oil is, in its very core, plant-based. It's not marked as a hazardous material, but it has additives and whatnot to make it uh, long-term stable. It doesn't go, uh, it doesn't harden. It doesn't go rancid like uh, cooking oils. And it smells a little bit like a mineral oil, like, like a whey oil. I would say it's not much worse than running coolant. It's different, of course. It's very different. You need, you need a ton of rags during the day. You need quite a bit of shop towel or uh, paper towels to clean parts, but also you need to clean parts from coolant. The parts I make require usually cleaning. I, if, even if I was running um, coolant, I couldn't just blow the parts dry with an air gun and ship them. But the oil residue from coolant would also be too much dirt. My parts always require me to wash them in the out of sun cleaner with or with soap and a bristle brush or hot water or in isopropane alcohol or uh, there are many ways to clean parts. This is another thing that the flood coolant system on the machine allows me to do. Um, routing off a piece of six millimeter um, plastic tubing through a small ball valve and a very small coupler. This is an air coupler, but they also work for liquid media like oil or coolant. Uh, and I can hook it up to things like my holder for annular cutters, so I get oil through the tool, which is rather beneficial. Granted, the pump in, in the machine doesn't put out any reasonable amount of pressure, but the oil flow is enough to, to make it work very well. Also, this allows me to take boring bars. I have a, a fitting on the back of some of my boring bars. I used to run compressed air through them to clear chips, but um, to be honest, we can also run oil through them. Which I think will be rather nice. Well, it's a horrendous mess, of course. And you end up with oil everything. And 
and I will be wiping down everything constantly with paper towels and rags. But I have done machining in this shop, well, in the basement shop and this shop for eight years now, always with a dump oil can in my hand, applying oil by hand with an oil can or with a brush. And so this is a very nice change of pace. Okay, that's with the go side of the gauge. I flipped around for the no go side. No go side on a thread gauge cannot engage more than one full revolution. And this one, well, uh, it wants to start. And I get about uh, less than half a revolution out of it once it's started. So I consider this fine. I'll leave it like that. I'm not going to muck around with the thread. And yeah, yeah, of course, um, this is uh, 316L stainless steel 14404, which threads rather nicely, but it helps to have some cutting oil there. Usually I would be there with a with small bottle with a needle applicator and just applying oil by hand, but it's nice to have the oil coming pumped through the tool or through a lock line hose onto the tool tip and have both hands free to operate and manipulate the machine when necessary, especially with threading. It's always nice to have a second hand to retract the tool. The other hand controls the spindle rotation. It's very convenient. And uh, despite oil is not very good at flushing away the chips, you still get a little bit of that effect with it. Uh, coolant from a high pressure pump would be better to flush chips. Uh, for, for that matter, coolant through this pump would also be better at flushing chips. The oil has a higher viscosity, it's, it has more resistance to get pumped. So the, the the volume stream is not as high as it would be with coolant, but the higher lubricity of the oil is enough of an excuse for me to use the oil instead, plus the reduced mess. Let's talk about the solid tool post on this machine. As you can see, we entered the post solid tool post era. This machine most likely will not get a solid tool post. I will keep the rather overbuilt compound slide on it because I have one particular customer with one particular series of parts that requires me to have a compound slide for diamond turning and diamond burnishing. I'm using a monocrystalline diamond tool to do outside taper turning and a diamond burnishing tool to create a mirror surface on the inside of an aluminium part. And that can only be done as it's a tapered surface with the compound slide on the machine. I would prefer to have a solid tool post on this machine, but I also prefer not changing back and forth. And this machine being a little bit smaller than the Emco does not really allow to put the compound back here. And so far I'm using this machine now for like almost a month, I think. Um, so far I have not felt negative influence from the compound slide. You might ask, but Stefan, you have like a whole lot of Multifix tool holders for your tool post with preset tools. 
uh, there are even more and there are also a few and that's true and the moment you swivel the compound slider around all those settings are for <laughs> are for nothing so i have a method for now that seems to work i keep the the compound most of the time parallel when i'm just doing your regular work it just stays parallel and i don't touch it i zero out the dro on on the compound so i know it's in a defined position i could even clamp it but i'm usually not a big fan of clamping slides on leaves it's usually not necessary just keep it parallel indicate it in and it's good and i indicate the tool post true to the travel too so when i put in a drill chuck i'm on line with the machine axis so usually i just run an indicator along here to find the soft faced hammer i have one of the screws mildly tightened so it doesn't squirm around on me when i fully tighten it just like this and then i Just like this and I fully tighten it down and now it's on axis and now I have to do the same for the tool post itself tool post comes loose with a single nut I would prefer to have the tool post pinned but that's not possible because I need to be able to freely spin it to align it with the travel of the machine yeah I could pin it in one position for for example my preferred used position at zero degrees but then I would have to pull the pin and uh, that's just another step that I'm most, most likely not going to do if it's just adding more complication than then it's probably worth so for it quickly indicating it in just put a tool holder in it and I'm indicating the face of the tool holder the official method for a multi-fix is to use a boring bar holder and a long test bar in the multi-fix boring bar holder but I found for what I do that indicating the face of a regular turning tool holder is fine then we tighten it down and now I'm in my regular working positions and I prefer I kind of prefer the, the compound to be parallel to the carriage because when I actually use the compound my movement of the compound doesn't change my tool diameter <laughs> which is rather annoying when you're at 45 or, or 60 degrees for threading for example I still will zero out the compound on each tool that I'm using so I see when I move it accidentally but usually it doesn't get moved uh, all straight OD and ID turning is done with the carriage and the cross slide the compound is only for compound work so that's how I'm handling the compound slide on this machine and yeah I'm, I'm losing my my tool tool offsets for example um, I'm losing I'm by by rotating the tool post and the compound slide around you kind of lose all the tool offsets of course but it's really quick to just drop tool number three for example back in which is a OD turning tool and facing tool select set datum number three sdm three enter turn a small section of a workpiece hit my diameter that i measured and go from there and then until i touch the compound setting or the tool post setting it's fine i can go back and forth and all my all my precision will stay as i want it to stay when I'm 
switching the, the compound, well, all bets are off. But so far, this is a workflow that I'm quite happy with. It's rather quick. I like to work, I like solutions. The, the longer I do this, the more I like solutions that are very easy and very easy to, to do because if it's, it's, if it's complicated, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm pretty self-aware here. Also, I'm not dealing with C offset, meaning length offsets. I'm only interested in, in storing the X value. The C value is just touching off on the tool and zeroing it. The C value is only touching off on the face of the part, doing a facing cut and then zeroing out C. And that's my datum. I'm not storing or calculating offsets between tools. Uh, that's a whole mess for, that, that's, that belongs on a CNC machine in my mind. Uh, that gets extremely troublesome on a manual machine very quickly and the workflow is not very nice for this. And same for drill chuck. Drill chuck goes back into this, gets quickly aligned with, with either an indicator if I feel very fancy that day or I just use a spot drill in the face of the part and I align on how the drill behaves. I hope you enjoyed this overview of what's going on with the new lathe and maybe got some insight on especially why I use the cutting oil instead of coolant and I'm sure you will see more of the oiling mess in future on my machines. So thank you all for watching, thanks for the support and I'll be back.